morning and welcome to Moments with Melinda. I am your host, Melinda Moulton, and my guest today is Sean Lawson. Hey, Sean, how you doing? I'm doing great. Good morning, Melinda. Thank you for having me on. Well, thank you for spending this snowy morning with me instead of racing up to Mad River to get your runs in, but I am really glad to have this time with you. Let me share with my viewers who don't know you. I'm sure most people do, but let me share with them who you are. Sean Lawson is a naturalist, forester, environmentalist, social justice soldier, lover of wildlife, conservationist, community builder, entrepreneur, business leader, philanthropist, beer brewer, and devoted husband and father of two daughters. Is that about right, Sean? Wow, that is impressive. Thank you very much, Melinda. Can you send me that list? I will. I will. Well, you'll see it. It's going to be, it's going to be up on YouTube. Um, so you will see it. So, Sean, you grew up in New Jersey. Tell me a little bit about growing up in New Jersey. I did, the Garden State. And uh, although New Jersey gets a bad rap, it was a pretty decent place to grow up. I grew up right near the beach, um, the Jersey Shore. So not the Jersey Shore that you see in the MTV show, but the real Jersey Shore where regular people uh, do regular things like hang out and go swimming. And I, I spent a lot of time growing up chasing um, fish and blue claw crabs. I, I was kind of an avid outdoors person. And um, growing up by the ocean, uh, it was a great place to, to grow up. And like a lot of kids from New Jersey early on, we started making trips to Vermont to go skiing. And it helped that I had family here in Vermont too, because uh, we'd come up to see my uncle. He was a professor at UVM for just about 45 years in uh, psychology, uh, Robert Lawson. And uh, my grandmother had a lake house on Lake Maury where we'd go to visit in the summer um, and spend a couple of weeks uh, at the at the lake house recreating and more fishing and water skiing. And I got hooked on Vermont early on, um, but New Jersey was not a, not a bad place to to grow up. But thankfully, I don't have any Jersey accent. No well, coffee for well, me. Well, I'm, I'm from I'm from <laughs> Pennsylvania and. And I used to travel, me and my friends used to travel to Port Jarvis to drink, drink beer probably. <laughs> um, and, and all we had to do was drive across the Jersey border mm -hmm. and because drinking back then was much more liberal in New Jersey than it was in Pennsylvania. So, so what was your favorite beer back then? My father drank Rolling Rock and had it on tap in, in, his, in, his, uh, in, in his den. What was your favorite beer back then? Oh gosh, I remember one of the the first uh, beers that I got turned on to was uh, the black and gold uh, Miller Genuine Draft, <laughs> and then in in college, uh, although it was not quite legal drinking age, uh, it had just changed in Vermont. It had been eighteen in Vermont, so the, the, it was a bit more liberal back then and um the beers my favorite beers were whatever's on sale so as a college student it's like what's the cheapest <laughs> rolling rock was in the rotation um oh my gosh milwaukee's best uh those you know but you were a miller high life guy what can i say yeah I still enjoy it i'm an equal opportunity beverage uh drinker and enjoyer so um, I don't turn my nose up at, at macro beers. They have their place in their time. Thank so you. yeah, a Miller High Life, they, it's called the champagne of beers for a reason. <laughs> well, you're kind of an equal opportunity guy anyway about everything. So, so you used to come to Vermont and visit your, your grandmother and your uncle taught at UVM. So, so what yeah. brought you here to live? What, what finally brought you here to settle? It was uh, choosing the University of Vermont, um, which is a fun story uh, when I was looking at colleges. And my cousin Steve was a student um, at the time at UVM. He's three years older than I am. And that's my uncle, the professor, Robert, his son. And so Steve hosted me for a tour. He took me around the campus. I had a, I had a good time visiting, going to some of his classes, learning more about the school. Um, but it was that evening that really sealed the deal because he took me out to um, to go visit with his friends. And it's a Tuesday night. And he's like, hey, want to go over? My buddy's having a keg party 
at his apartment and I'm like, it's a Tuesday and you're having a keg party. He's like, yeah. And there's this band playing down at the bar called Nectars and we're going to go check them out after the kegger. And so I was like, cool. And we went down to Nectars and what do you know, there's this band in 1988, uh, called fish that had about 30 people at the bar there. And I had such a good time that evening. I was hooked on, uh, UVM and I decided that's where I would go to school. And that's how I, that's how I ended up in Vermont full time. That's outstanding. Well, we can give credit to fish and nectars and, and they're all still around as are you. Yeah. So tell, tell us a little bit about, um, the nonprofit organization, keeping track that you worked at, um, one of your, I think one of your earlier, uh, you know, careers and that you worked sure. with two more out of Jericho. Tell us a little bit about that nonprofit. Yeah, that was a, a, those years were incredible. It was very formative for me as a, as an aspiring naturalist and as a forester to spend that time with Sue Morris. So Susan Morris is, um, she is many things. She is a wildlife um, guru. She's a wildlife tracker. She's a wildlife habitat specialist. Um, she's a citizen science scientist. She's an amazing photographer. Uh, she writes brilliantly and she's a walking encyclopedia of all things wildlife and their habitats. So uh, when I, Mad River features, like Mad River Glen has this thread that runs through my whole life in Vermont, starting in college when I first skied there. I hadn't skied at Mad River before I went to college. And so um, at the time I had uh, it all, the, the thread ties, the ties things together is that I was a ski patroller at Mad River Glen um, back in the mid nineties, first as a volunteer and then as a paid professional. And I only, um, I, I had an esteemed career as, an, as a pro patroller for one year, at the end of which I broke my femur, which was pretty a pretty devastating injury. I spent nine days in the hospital. But what, like with every uh, sort of major challenge or really significant problem, or even, even in tragedy, um, there's opportunity. And the opportunity for me was to take a fresh look at what I was doing for work and and so that summer, I was looking around at job opportunities where I could get around still with a with a uh, a cane. I was using a cane, and I was rehabbing. And I saw this job for a park naturalist at Brighton State Park up in Island Pond, and I was able to land the job. And that really, that really was started my um, avocation as a naturalist. And so it was through that experience that then. Um, the next year, I proposed to the newly formed Mad River Glen Cooperative that we start a naturalist program and start to educate people about the outdoors um, and inc incorporate that into the mission of the mountain to preserve and protect and um, for other skiing and recreational access that, hey, maybe we should have an ed educational component. And the board loved it. Um, the general manager back there then was Boomer. And um, he was supportive of the idea. And so we started the naturalist program. And it was shortly after I started that program that I connected with Sue Morris by going to one of her presentations. Um, she puts on a great slideshow and she's a captivating speaker and she has an amazing sense of humor as well. And um, so I met her and then uh, I don't know how, how the opportunity for the job came up. I don't recall um exactly but i applied for and and landed the job with keeping track that was a growing nonprofit at the time of uh, four or five people um, with a mission to do uh citizen science training and wildlife education and to train people how to use track and sign in their local community to inform planning and conservation in their local community and so um, that that time that I got to spend with Sue in the field and driving around to do various programs I learned so much about tracking and about the wildlife that inhabit the the north country here and she's just a really fun person to be around she has a great sense of humor um, and she has a way of captivating groups when whether she's giving a slideshow or she's out in the woods uh, with a group of folks that are um, doing a program with her. So it was a really 
um, formative time. I worked for Keeping Track for about six years, and I led their youth program. So I, I focused um, most of my time on doing programs both in schools and out in the field for school groups. Well, hats off to Sue Morse. Yeah. Watching Sue. Absolutely. I mean, really, truly. And and I sort of see you as kind of being the Mr. Rogers of the nature track, tracks at Mad <laughs> River Glen. And that program's still going strong. Am I correct? Yes, still going strong. I'm still involved in the program. Um, I've led a handful of programs up there this year, and uh, we're we're off to a great start for the for the season. We've had um, we've had some renewed interest in the programming this year. Well, I was I was in the base box the other day at lunch, and some guy goes, "Look, look!" And we looked out, and from the bottom of the practice hill, running over towards the the, the board for the ski school, was a white ermine with black tips on his ears and black on his tail. Awesome. And he was, he was yeah. racing. And so anyway, this is a little controversial, but H191 is hand is heading into the legislature this year. And I worked yeah. on banning the leg hole trap with Iris Mugenthaler all the way back in the mm -hmm. 1990s. What, mm -hmm. What's your position on leg hole trapping? You know, I haven't really, uh, I haven't really considered that issue. I've given that much much thought um, as a, which has been an interesting journey as a business owner, because when we started business, started a business 15 years ago, our approach and our sort of strategy was let's not get involved in politics. Let's remain apolitical. Um, but the last few years have showed us, have shown us that um, saying and doing nothing is taking a position and that by and that we have a responsibility as a business um, to uh, to use our voice and our platform um, to advocate for the values that are central to how we run our company and who we want to be in the world as as a business. So we okay. found it more important to to uh, lean into the the, um, the idea of taking a stand on. Um, social and racial justice issues and the issues here in Vermont of affordable housing and living wages and child care. Um, those are all things that are central to us. As a wildlife um, enthusiast, I, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a strong advocate for a balanced approach to managing our landscape. And, um, you know, I support, uh, folks that want to ethically uh, hunt um, animals, especially folks that harvest deer for, for uh, that it's an important source of uh, their, their, their diet over the course of a year. So um, I try to walk the, the fine line of being uh, both a conservationist and a, and, and a pragmatic, um, you know, business owner. Well, absolutely. I, and I, I really honor you in that. Um, so, Sean, uh, I, well, for, I, wanted to, I want to tell my viewers well, your website. It's sure. Lawsons, with an S, L-A-W-S-O-N-S, finest.com. Yeah. I suggest you go to the website because it's so much fun. It's colorful. It's fun. It's informative. So when did, when did you realize that you had a knack for beer brewing? The, the origin story of Lawson's Finest and of my journey here in Vermont. And it was while I was a student, um, I was a junior and my friend, um, Matt Robinson, uh, who just called me a couple of the days ago, we, we lost track of each other for a number of years, uh, but we reconnected in the last year, which has been really great. And so he invited me over one day. He said, hey, wanna come try some of my homebrew? And I was like, well, heck yeah. So I went over to his apartment and he cracked open a couple of bottles and he poured it into a couple of glasses and I started sipping on it. And I was like, wow, you made this? He's like, yeah, I made this. I'm like, this is great. This is, this is better than anything that I can buy in the store. Can you show me how you made it? And he's like, of course, I would love to. And so I did what every aspiring home brewer does, which is run out to the store buy a copy of Charlie Papazian's The Complete Joy of Homebrewing and a starter kit and a big soup pot and a couple of plastic buckets and a glass carboy. 
Um, and a couple of weeks later, Matt came over to my apartment and we were cooking up my first batch of homebrew on the kitchen uh, stove, um, of course, which I then promptly uh, didn't pay close enough attention to. And the infamous boil over happened where right when it hits, comes to a boil, it gets really frothy and foamy and it likes to just pour right out of the top of the, the pot and, and make a big sticky mess um, on the stove top, which is why um, partners and spouses are often not fans of their, their home brewing partners because they make a big sticky mess in the kitchen. <laughs> oh, I got what a great story. And the fact that you connected. So, so he tasted your first home brew and how was it? It was pretty good. I remember it well. It was a, I was uh, inspired by the beers that Catamount Brewing was making at the time and uh, the Vermont Pub and Brewery. So that's when I, a couple of years into college, I discovered really flavorful beer that moved on from the Miller Genuine Draft and the Rolling Rock on Special to um, the Burley Irish Ale and the um, Bombay Grab um, and the Maple uh, ale that the Vermont Pub and Brewery and their Spruce Tip Ale, those are all beers I remember fondly, and Catamount Brewing, their Porter. And so I made a Maple Wheat Ale was my first uh, my first home brew. And so Maple is featured prominently in the beers that I've made ever since then. I've always been fascinated by using this uniquely Vermont ingredient in beer. And it's very healthy for you. It is very antioxidant. So, yeah. so from that, then we're going to get into how it grew into where it is today, which is this extraordinary. Sure. But tell me a little bit about meeting your wife and your business partner. Um, Karen, tell us a little bit about that. Again, the thread runs through Mad River Glen. And so I was living here in the Mad River Valley, and this is back in um, 1999. Um, and Karen and one of her friends came up to Mad River Glen for one of our popular full moon snowshoe events. And at the time we were doing a potluck dinner uh, with before the snowshoe. Uh, and uh, so she came to the potluck dinner with her friend. I, I certainly noticed her. And uh, yet at the time I was, uh, I was dating another woman. And so we didn't, we didn't really connect then she, she, in her words, she could tell my love light was not on and so not available. And so a year later, I was single and she came back to do another full moon snowshoe and we hit it off and we conversed quite a bit on the snowshoe. And um, it turned out through that, that in the small world uh, that she had interviewed with my uncle when she was... Um, being considered as a student for the master's in public administration at UVM. So she applied for and got into the MPA program. And my uncle, Robert Lawson, was instrumental in helping to get that program uh, off the ground when he was the uh, dean of the graduate college. And so she had interviewed with my uncle and she's like, are you related to Robert Lawson? And I'm like, yeah, he's my uncle. So it's a small world. And then after that, um, the fun part of the story was we didn't see each other um, for a few weeks and we hadn't, there was a, there was a spark there, but we hadn't like exchanged phone numbers or anything. Um, and a couple of weeks later, uh, it was February 6th, which is Bob Marley's birthday. And we both ended up at the old Bluetooth for um, a reggae band uh, and an event celebrating Bob Marley's birthday. And we we were, uh, there was clearly something, love was in the air when we met up that night and we we danced and it was a full moon and we ended the evening with our first kiss. So, and from there it was uh, a year later, we got engaged and we were married in uh, 2001. So it's a pretty, uh, it's, it's a, a pretty, pretty romantic love story. Beautiful love story. <laughs> so, so Sean, I was sorry to hear about the passing of your dad. Um, yeah. He must have been so very, very proud of you. Can you tell us a little bit about him? Yeah, thank you for asking. I appreciate that. Um, the family background on my dad's side is pretty interesting because his mother, um, Isabel, Im immigrated um, from Ireland when she was a wee lass from Belfast. She came over on a boat 
And uh, they went through Ellis Island. They ended, her family ended up in New Orleans somehow um, for a period of time, uh, but not for very long. And then they came back up to New York City um, because there was a pretty, uh, pretty distinct Irish uh, community in the Bronx. And so they moved to the Bronx where there were other families that had emigrated from Ireland. And that's where my dad grew up in kind of a, um, I don't know if hard scrabble is the right word, but I heard a lot of stories about how little to nothing that they had growing up. They had a one bedroom apartment um, and it, uh, my grandmother had met um, her husband, Robert, um, through, through working uh, and they got married and had three kids. My dad was the, uh, the middle of the three of the three kids um his older brother was robert and his uh his younger sister was may and so um they grew up in the bronx in a one bedroom apartment and a walk up so i forget they had a whole bunch of flights there was no elevator there was a dumb waiter um and so of course my uncle and my dad were prone to pranks so we heard a few stories about using the dumb waiter to um to jump from their side of the uh, apartment over into the apartment of uh, an attractive young lady that lived across the hall when the parents weren't around so that they could visit. And so um, there, my my uncle uh, uh, who passed away uh, this, this past year put together this amazing uh, little book, uh, a tribute to my dad. It's really the story of both of their lives growing up. And so after he, uh, I, one more, one more, just quick story about my grandmother, because like what was reflective of their upbringing was that, you know, he remembers times of dinner was getting a beef marrow bone, you know, from the market and whatever he worked at a vegetable stand, um, and they would get some of the scraps and some of the seconds or, or the discards, that were still edible, but were not the prettiest. They were like the, uh, they, before gleaning was a word, uh, that's what they were doing. They were gleaning from the fruit from the fruit and produce stand. And that would be dinner, would be some, some barley, a marrow bone, and whatever vegetables they could scrape together in a big pot. Beef barley stew was one of my grandmother's specialty dishes and she had just the right seasonings to make what would otherwise be a pretty meager offering into a, a pretty tasty uh, meal. So from the Bronx, they moved to New Jersey. That's how I ended up growing up in New Jersey. And he went to, I mean, there are so many stories I could tell about my dad. He went to Monmouth College. Um, he was not a very good student at first. He was more interested in partying than studying, and he managed to fail himself out. And so my grandmother and grandfather kicked him out of the house and said, you're on your own. And so that really taught him the value of hard work. And so he went out and he got a full-time job. He reapplied to get back into Monmouth College, which is now Monmouth University. Um, and he worked and paid his way through the rest of college. Um, which was pretty impressive. And he went into uh, he went into accounting. He cut his teeth in New York City, working at some of the big CPA firms. And then after um, gaining some experience, he um, and my uncle on my mother's side, um, Frank Grasso and another one of his friends decided to strike out on their own and form their own um, their own accounting firm. Um, and they went into business together. And over the years, my dad had a succession of accounting firms. And so I didn't realize it until I was a few years into business that in a way, like he was really an entrepreneur. I always thought of him as a businessman, but really he was an entrepreneur because he wanted to go into business for himself and work for himself. And so he was very proud that Lawson was the first name on the masthead at the, uh, at the companies that he started and and worked with a team of people because it was they were partnerships, so the teamwork was essential. Well, the yeah. well the acorn does not fall very far from the mighty oak, <laughs> and entrepreneurs <laughs> definitely business people. And as you are, I mean, you have built up a sensational uh, company uh, with yeah, lots of liquids, um, and your 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 products are adored, and yeah. and you know. Early on, you can only find them if you got to healthy living 
I'm, I'm shocked yeah. in Burlington. If you got, if you had to get there on a Wednesday by eleven, and day. lined yeah. up, you know, for forty feet with their carts, and they'd just be picking up. Okay, but anyway, you're a sensation. So you built your brewery, your tap room, and your retail store in Waitsfield in 2018. Your wife Karen runs your social impact program, your SIP. Uh, which is yeah. extraordinary. And the amount of money that you folks donate to the most important things that we all should be focused on is remarkable. Uh, you were named Vermont Small Business of the Year in 2020. And you received the Dean Davis Outstanding Vermont Business Award. Uh, and I and I would venture that you've probably won many more awards and, a- and accolades. And as we're coming to the end of this, this show, I, I want to dig into your brain a little bit about what do you tell young people your two daughters today yeah. about the world they are growing up in and how do we teach them to navigate and advocate? Wow. Well, that's the hardest question of all, Melinda, because it's a, it's a complicated world out there and it seems more challenging to navigate every year. And so what, uh, what I focus on in the positive aspect is first be safe, stay safe and know, um, what the real hazards are out there and follow your passion is really what I um, am trying to instill in them as, as young adults is that the world is full of opportunity. And so if you really focus on what it is that um, is important to you, that resonates with you internally, that feels right um, and you work hard at it, um, that you can achieve almost anything. And uh, so my older daughter is going into college next year. She's a senior in high school. And so she's interested in studying business management. And I've told her, you may, yeah, you may, you may take those classes and find out that really business management isn't for you. And maybe you're more, maybe there's some other business you're interest type of uh, aspect of it that you're interested in, whether it's you know, the marketing or the sales aspect, or maybe it's not business at all. I was an environmental studies major and I ended up in the beer business. So you or never maybe, know where life is. Or maybe she's yeah. interested in becoming the CEO. She might be. Yeah, which might be <laughs> very well where she lands, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. So with the right set of uh, life experiences and education, that's a real possibility for her uh-huh. someday, which is pretty, pretty exciting. Uh, but we also think about it in terms of follow your own passion. We don't want to saddle our kids with the burden of the business. And so if they have no interest in the business that we've created, that's fine. Um, I don't I don't expect that they that they should or that they have to get involved in the business. However, they both have they both have jobs there and they've been working. Um, they work their way up just like every um, young adult that gets a job with Lawson's finest. You start in the uh you start in the uh, in the kitchen at the dishwasher and you wash dishes. And as you gain um, skills and experience there, you do a few more things in the kitchen. And if you're interested, you can move out onto the floor and be a, a floater, runner, a busser, um, which is sort of a beer tender in training. But of course, you have to be 21 to serve and to sell the beer. So they have a few years to go yet. So, well, bravo to you and, yeah. and to Karen for your, your, the, your beautiful daughters. So now you are a stargazer, I understand, and you have the Sky Guide app and you are a universal, <laughs> you are a universal yeah. thinker. So what is your yeah. vision for the future of our planet and our species? Oh, gosh. Well, we need to, uh, we need to address the climate crisis uh, really head on. That's the most significant challenge. And it's really right there in front of us if we can move away from fossil fuels. And I worked on a project as a senior when I was in at the University of Vermont in environmental studies that was um, a practicum. And it asked just this question to vision the future. And I tried to envision, well, like, what it, would it be like in an ideal world? And even back then, that was more than 30 years ago. And it was clear that that it's right in front of us that the power of the sun can fuel our planet in a way that creates clean and green energy. So I really feel like solar power uh, and the electrification of our transportation and heating and cooling and energy systems um, is 
that's the that's the promise of the future to get to a a more carbon neutral planet. Um, and then I think there's just the Earth is so resilient in its systems, and if we allow the Earth to recover from all the abuse of that humankind has has subjected it to over the last few hundred years, um, she can recover quickly. So I love the half Earth uh, uh, mission. Um, uh, to, to I can't articulate it quite accurately, but you're familiar with it. Um, and this premise that if we protect E.O. Wilson and if we protect half the earth, we're well on our way to um, building resili a resilient planet. And you're, um, and you're going 100% solar, I understand. We are. We are. We have our, uh, our next project coming online this spring. It's in progress. So um, the electrical work um, is largely done and we're upgrading the power to the buildings down at Mad River Canoe Road. And so that project will bring us to um, generating right here in Waitsfield, Vermont, at nearly the 45th latitude, uh, all uh, more energy, at least as much, if not more energy in the form of electricity than we use each year. So I'm really proud of that. And we set a goal to do it by 2025, and we'll beat that goal by two years. And so once that's completed, we'll start envisioning the next three to five years. What are the steps that we can take to become more carbon neutral um, overall as a company and continue to reduce our, our energy and our carbon footprint? Wow. Well, you know, we're out of time, Sean, and I could talk to you forever. <laughs> and I know my viewers would love to hear about you forever. So thank you for giving us the world. Thank you for giving us yeah. That little sip of sunshine and <laughs> all of the double and triple and little sips of hope and happiness. And you are a bright star. You and Karen and your daughters are a thank bright you. light in the world. And I want to thank you for being with me today and all that you do for Vermont and especially for the Mad River Valley. And to all of my viewers out there, um, go on down to Waitsfield and check out, you know, Lawson's. It's right there on Route 100. And it's just a beautiful place to be. And I know probably most of my viewers are certainly loving your little sips, right? Excellent. Well, thank you for all those kind words, Melinda. I really appreciate it. I appreciate, appreciate the opportunity to speak to your viewers. And if they, if they want to learn more about our social impact program or anything about Lawson's Finest to, or our core values and our mission and vision for the future, um, lawsonsfinest.com is where you can find it all. Lawson'sFinest.com. You bet, my friend. Well, listen, we yeah. got a snowstorm brewing out there, and I know you want to get over to Mad River and put in some runs. So I'm going to say goodbye and wish all my viewers a beautiful day and stay safe out there.